In this video, we're going to consider some objections to Putnam's examples. It's worth thinking through how we would push back in these cases on behalf of the internalist or the psychologist view of meaning. One thing we could do is we could just, and this is a very popular move, is just to push back on Putnam's intuition that on twin earth, water means X, Y, Z. Because you might think, well, what water just is, is clear, drinkable water, which is odorless, and so on. So if that's what water means, then we must just be wrong when we thought that on twin earth, water means X, Y, Z. And, or, and in particular, that water means something different on twin earth to what it means on earth. I think one important thing to say to this, though, is that when you think about this doesn't entirely fit super well with how we would talk if we you know landed on twin earths and made and and inspected what they call water there because imagine if we went to twin earth and we landed there when we got out we'd be amazed to find that everything looks the same but as time went on maybe we come round to inspecting what water is like we take a sample of water and we analyze it under a microscope and we see that this fluid is not made of H2O, it's made of XYZ. How would we describe that? Well, it looks like we would say, well, hang on, this isn't water at all. This is really, this is really XYZ. It can't be water, it's not H2O. That seems like it would be a very natural thing for us to say when we got to Twin Earth and we saw what they called water is made of. But notice, exactly the same thing would happen with the Twin Earth people if they came to Earth. If they came to Earth, Initially, everything would look the same. They would conclude that everything, you know, everything works exactly the same on Earth as it did on Twin Earth. But eventually, when they get around to analyzing a sample of water, how would they describe what they would find? It seems very likely that how they would describe it is they would say the sentence, this isn't water after all. It's not, it's not XYZ. Is one of us getting it wrong? Are both of us getting it wrong? It seems like no. The answer is that these are perfectly good ways to report what each of us has found in our own language. The way for me to, to report what I discovered on Twin Earth is to say, this isn't water. It's actually a, a, a slightly different compound. That also looks like the right thing for the Twin Earthling to say. They should also say, when they get to Earth, they should say, this isn't water. It's made of a different compound from water. But if those, both of those people are right in their reports, me what I say on Earth, and twin me what, what me what I say when I get to twin Earth, and twin me what he says when he gets to, to regular Earth, then this speaks against the strategy of, of denying the intuition, of saying water really just means something like clear, drinkable liquid, and so on. Because if that's what water meant, then I would just be getting it wrong when I said, this isn't water on twin Earth. And likewise, my twin would be getting it wrong when he said, this isn't water on Earth. Both of those claims would be wrong if water just meant the same thing on Earth as it did on Twin Earth. One other thing to say to this initial objection that maybe XYZ really is water is that it doesn't seem tenable in the Elms and Beaches case. There we saw a case where, you know, my connotation for Elm is basically the same as your connotation for beach, and yet Elm doesn't mean the same thing as beach does. What you know when you know the meaning of the word beach is very different from what I know when I know the meaning of the word Elm. Even if you really could say that, after all, water is X, Y, Z, it seems much harder to say, well, maybe in the end, Elms really are beaches. That seems like pretty hard to, that seems pretty hard to maintain. It seems pretty clear that Elms are a different kind of tree from beaches. Um, and I'm not sure any view of meaning should really try to convince us other, of, of anything else. But notice for that objection to really work, we have to sort of take for granted at the later stage we know what H2O is. I won't have any grounds for saying this isn't water when I get to Twin Earth, unless I know that what I call water on Earth is H2O. Likewise, Twin Me won't have any grounds for saying this isn't water when he gets to Earth if he doesn't know that what he calls water on Twin Earth is XYZ. So one strategy you could pursue is maybe to say, well, maybe the meaning of water changed whenever we discovered what water was made of. Maybe water means the same thing on Earth and Twin Earth up until the discovery of H2O slash XYZ, and from that point onwards they mean different things. That would accommodate this fact that when I go to Earth I'm able to say this, 
Now, when I go to twin Earth, I'm able to say this isn't water, and that twin me is able to say this isn't water when he gets to Earth. But in a way, it's able to preserve the internalist view as well, because the, the view is basically, until you figure out what it's made of, until you're able to add that to your connotation, the words will mean the same things. It's only after what we discovered what water is made of that there emerges a difference in meaning. Because up until then, water meant something like clear drinkable liquid. After then, it means clear drinkable liquid made of H2O for me. And for twin me, it means clear drinkable liquid made of XYZ. So this objection says they do mean the same thing up until you figure out what their composition is. The worry with this suggestion is that there isn't really a lot of actual positive evidence for it. And in fact, what I'll call correction data seem to go the other way. So let's just imagine a slightly more sophisticated, a slightly more sci-fi version of the original 1700s Twin Earth case. So in this case, we're imagining Oscar again in the 1700s. And he's faced with what looks like a glass of water in front of him. There's a glass with this clear drinkable liquid in it. And Oscar says, that's water, or that glass is full of water. But in this version of the case, imagine that sort of mysteriously, a glass of XYZ had been transported to, to regular Earth. Or to regular Earth. Now imagine that us, living 300 years later, somehow find out about this incident. We somehow find out that Oscar was faced with this glass of XYZ, what we now know was a glass of XYZ, and said of it that it is water. The question is, what would we say about what, about what the claim that Oscar made here? Was Oscar right to say that is water when he was looking at XYZ? And the intuition that many people will have going along with Putnam is that actually Oscar said something false here, because what he thought was water was actually XYZ, and so not water. The reasoning will go. But of course, if that's right, that's a problem for this objection, that the meaning of the word changed after the discovery that water is H2O. Because if it was right that before we figured out that water was H2O, all it meant was clear drinkable liquid, then we, we would be wrong to disagree with Oscar here. We would be wrong to say that his claim is false. Because given the meaning it had, it should be perfectly true. There, there is indeed a, a, a clear drinkable substance in front of him. So if you have this intuition that Oscar is actually saying something wrong, that we could correct him, we could say, in fact, it turns out he was wrong. He was faced with this glass of, he was mysteriously faced with this glass of X, Y, Z even though there's no way you could have known that at the time. If that's what you want to say about this case, that again is a problem for this idea that the meaning changed. Not for, well, maybe not for the, the changing bit, but the, but the idea that before the change, before the discovery that water was H2O, all it meant was clear drinkable liquid. One other tactic you could say is to say, well, maybe in some sense we really don't know the meaning of water after all. There would only be a counterexample if we had, you know, two people who knew the meaning of some, of some words, which picked out different things, and yet were in the same psychological state. If we deny that Oscar and twin Oscar know the meaning of water in the first place, or what it means in their language, then we don't have a counterexample. We only have a counterexample if they do, in fact, know the meanings of their words. The problem with this is it really seems to be getting kind of rather desperate. A very good indicator of whether you know the meaning of a word is or whether you're able to use it to talk to people about the relevant objects. And of course, that's something that Oscar and twin Oscar can do. They can say loads of things about water. They can ask for a glass of water. They can want, that. they can tell somebody that they want a glass of water. And they can get a glass of water by telling somebody that that's what they want. It seems like Oscar and twin Oscar can communicate lots of things using the word water. And notice as well that this kind of phenomenon is not just limited to the, to the word water. Really, we can apply this kind of case to, to anything whatsoever. So if you want to go this right, down this road of defending psychologism by saying, well, Oscar and twin Oscar, they don't really know the mean, what they mean by the words water in their respective languages. Then you'll be forced to say that actually, probably we really don't know very much of our language at all. Certainly no natural kind terms do we actually fully know the meaning of. 
despite the fact that we're able to say or communicate with each other about these things perfectly well. If that is the cost for de defending psychologism, if that's what it takes to defend psychologism, it's not really clear that it's worth it in the end. Because remember, ultimately we, we want a theory of language to explain how we're able to communicate with each other, how we're able to say things to each other, to inform each other, to get what we want by talking to each other. And if we can do all of those things without knowing what words mean, then it looks like meaning doesn't really, on this kind of theory, do a lot of work in explaining how we communicate with each other. And that, you might think, just looks like a bad theory of meaning. You might even think that the same goes for the element of each case. This, it's maybe a bit more plausible that we don't know the meanings of the words in these cases. But again, we are able to communicate plenty of things to each other about elms and beaches. I can tell you, for instance, that an elm is a tree. I can ask what kind of tree is it. I can tell you to go out and find me an elm tree. I can say lots of things using the word elm in a perfectly intelligible way. Doesn't that just look like good evidence that I know the meaning of the word?